Aloha, everybody. Welcome to Aloha Rising, uh, our latest uh, um, iteration of this of this webinar series today. Um, really looking forward to a, a, a robust discussion with um, some some great minds uh, in our Lahui, uh, representing um, their various expertise and backgrounds, working um, along. Uh, uh, working hands-on with uh, our community on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so today, um, we are continuing our discussions around um, uh, critical and important issues in our community. And um, in a time where we're obviously in the midst of elections and, and you know, just sharing, um, providing uh, an opportunity for folks to share the work that they do um, in uh, these given topic areas, and then providing an opportunity opportunity to discuss how it's in, you know how that connects to our kuleana to engage in us in in a political process, um, to participate in elections and just to overall be uh, civically engaged. Um, really important is you know we often I mean it's what we're experiencing right now is it's fairly unprecedented in terms of what how much information we see, you know, um, via social media and mainstream media about all the issues that we face. So we all see and hear a lot about what's wrong and what's going on. Um, I think that it's very important for us to obviously recognize what the problems are, but, you know, what I really enjoy about these conversations and about these webinars is we talk to people who come to the table and who work on the, in the community and, and have solutions-based work you know, that are doing uh, amazing work with our, with our Lahui and really working towards solutions. And it's important for us to also acknowledge that as well, right? When we, when we recognize that something's wrong, we should also be looking at how we fix that and, and really what our individual kuleana is to contributing towards those solutions. So we bring the experts on, uh, we talk story, and then, you know, we hope everyone takes away from these conversations something that um, a little bit, a little bit more uh, are familiar with the issues and then something that they can do, that each of us can do at home or with our ohana or, or in our communities, right, to, to address these issues and, and to really um, create uh, uh, healthy communities, vibrant communities and strive to um, make Hawaii a better place and something that is um, a place that you know we can all um, really enjoy and 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 feel good and happy about being here, um, right? Right. So, not to let the negative really you know uh, drown out all the the amazing gifts that we have here in Hawaii. So yeah, mahalo nui. Um, so today we'll be talking about our economy. Um, the last few weeks, we have covered um, some community issues, such as um, uh, the current, uh, you know, struggle to protect Aina and Hakipu. Um, then, you know, Hina and Halealoha Ayao shared, um, a, you know, a, a wealth of inf information about Iwi Kupuna, the practice of, of uh, Malama Iwi and our island burial councils and the, the unique kuleana that we have as Kanaka to Malama or Ibi Kupuna. Um, and last week, uh, we had a fantastic uh, uh, set of panelists um, discussing uh, affordable housing. Um, so if you weren't able, able to catch those live, please go visit oha.org slash vote, where you can see all of the Aloha Rising um, webinars cast thus far. Um, so. Yeah, there's a, there's a wealth of information there, a lot of expert ETA as well. So at this time, I will hand off. Um, we're going to be talking economy. We have a, another great uh, list of panelists here joining us and our, our fantastic uh, moderator, a good friend. I consider her a, a mentor. She was my old boss when I was in college and working, uh, interning at uh, Heia Fish Pond uh, in Kaneohe. Um, uh, and she does amazing work. I, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. She wears multiple hats. I guess I'll just say uh, she's the co-founder of Vai Vai Collective, a very uh, visionary. Um, actually, we have two of the co-founders here on the call, um, Kioni as well. But I'll start with Mahina, um, who's going to be moderating today. 
um, but co-founder of Vai Vai Collective, which, you know, is really, you know, I could say that this Aloha Rising webinar is really inspired by what you folks started at Vai Vai, which was to create a space for a community to gather and discuss issues, build community, build pilina, and, and move our lahui forward. So um, this really is kind of uh, an offshoot of that work that you folks initiated there. Very uh, innovative and, and visionary uh, work. And that's, that's probably the one word description I would provide for Mahina Paishan Dwar is, is visionary. Um, uh, so mahalo Mahina for joining us and I will hand off to you at this point to take it away. Mahalo ya oe Davis, a mahalo nui ya o ko pakahi, a mai kahi kihi a kahi kihi makei a hono nei ya o ko e kuu mau hoa aina, a kapo e kupa ana, mahope o ko kako aina aloha, velina meki aloha. It's such an honor to share this space with you to create a uh, courageous, innovative space, uh, especially on a virtual platform. So I have the honor now of um, acknowledging our luminous uh, panelists. Um, and, and I think it's gonna be a really enjoyable conversation because the three of them, what I see is that they span a small business to academia um, and, and everything in between. And so I think they're gonna basically be able to help weave uh, multiple perspectives of, of what is economy, what did economy look like perhaps, uh, the downfalls, uh, the advantages of, of the pre-COVID economy, and what kind of economy can we, we create together looking forward. So I'll start off with, with introductions. Our first guest is Dr. Randall Aki. He's the Associate Professor of Public Policy at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Aki is an Associate Professor in the Department of Public Policy and American Indian Studies at UCLA. Dr. Aki completed his doctorate at Harvard University in June 2006 and is also a proud graduate of Kamehameha Schools. Dr. Aki is an applied microeconomist um, and has worked in the areas of labor economics, economic development, and migration. Previously, he served on the National Advisory Council on Race, Ethnic, and Other Populations at the U.S. Census Bureau. Dr. Aki also spent several years working for the State of Hawaii Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Economic Development Division. He is a current research fellow at the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Next is um, dear friend Keoni Lee, he is the CEO of Hoi Investment Ready, um, a 501c nonprofit intermediary with a mission to support advance, uh, to support and advance Hawaii's impact sector. HR's core programs include this innovative social enterprise accelerator that is working at the nexus of culture, business, and purpose. Um, other HR programs include the Leveraging Hawaii Capital Impact Investing Workshop Series, which has been really awesome as a small business owner, the Hawaii Capital Scan, and the Kukulu Switchboard. If you didn't know, Kioni uh, co-founded OEB TV, which is the first Hawaiian language and culture, cultural television station, uh, and is, again, co-founder of Bye Bye Collective. He is a graduate of Kamehameha Schools, Oregon State University, and the UH Shidler School of Business. He is also a co-leader of the Aina Aloha Economics Future Initiative in which we can um, tease up a little bit uh, down the line of our conversation. Next, we have a mana wahine, Shannon Edi. She is the president of the Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce. Shannon is the president of the Native Hawaiian Cham Chamber of Commerce, is passionate about helping Native Hawaiians connect with each other and succeed in business. In addition, she's owner and co-founder of Holomua Consulting Group, a Native Hawaiian Women, woman owned small business that provides consulting services to federal contractors in the area of small business contracting programs and regulatory compliance. That is no small feat because I've looked into the amount of paperwork that you need to uh, complete in order to uh, acquire that kind of certification. Kudos to you. Shannon is a graduate of Kamehameha Schools, the University of Puget Sound, and of Santa Clara University School of Law, and is licensed to practice law in both Hawaii and California. Uh, she is also uh, serves on the board of directors of Purple Maya and the National Defense Industrial Association, Hawaii chapter. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for making the time. So what I thought we'd do before we start kind of getting into 
Nina Nino questions and, and conversation, I wanted to ask Dr. Aki if he would uh, open the space with just kind of like a refresher, you know, for those of us who, you know, haven't taken an economics course or haven't really delved into, again, what is economy and what is that composed of? I asked him to just kind of share and just kind of um, lay and level the foundation for us. And then we're going to dive into some, some interesting questions. Mahalo. So aloha kako, everybody. I uh, wanted to say thank you to um, uh, the invitation to be here, as well as, uh, you know, my fellow panelists. Uh, nice to, you know, be on this panel today. Uh, I am uh, acknowledge the uh, place that I am sitting right now, the land of the Tongva people, the indigenous peoples of the uh, Los Angeles Basin area, also known as Tavangar. Um, and um, just really happy to be able to share a little bit with you all. Yeah, so in terms of what the economy is, the economy is the uh, system in place that gets uh, things allocated uh, across the, 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 in Hawaii's case, islands uh, on the continent, you know, sort of uh, from different parts of the continent, continent to different uh, communities. Uh, and there are different systems that exist, the system that we, live in is a market-based one where um, you know, sort of goods and services clear uh, through uh, various marketplaces. Uh, and um, in the last few decades, we've seen a push to deregulate those markets, uh, which has meant uh, that there has been an impact on um, what we think of as uh, equality and um, efficiencies to some extent uh, and so we've actually seen a significant rise in income inequality across all of the developed countries uh, of the world in the past about 40, 40 years. Um, so there are various systems but but the basic economy and right and there are various different types of models there are subsistence models there are market-based models uh, there are collective mo models of economic uh, exchange, bartering, what have you. Um, but in terms of in terms of sort of what we're talking about in Hawaii and what the possibilities are, I think um, so. Uh, if we could show that slide again, sorry about that. I should have referenced it. You know, I think in terms of what has just happened in in recent memory uh, here. So this is just a a figure that shows all employees, total private employment in Hawaii since uh, the uh, early 90s. So it was about 420,000 uh, people employed in the early 90s. You see that that growth went up. Uh, uh, there was a drop after 2001, September 2001, when tourism took a hit when all the airlines closed. Uh, you know, we stopped flying for a while. Uh, the economy grew quite a lot in terms of employment, in terms of the number of jobs, right? This has nothing to say about uh, the living wage or, or people's earnings. That's a different figure that I actually don't have today. Um, but we could talk about that. But employment grew, right? Sort of it went from 420,000 to about 500,000. So 80,000 new jobs were added uh, between the early 90s and the mid 2000s. And then you see this steep drop off in the, over the Great Recession period. Uh, and then you see a, a, a build back of uh, employment up to about you know, 530, 540,000. And then this gray area right here on the far right is the pandemic. And so I, I wanted to show this because you know, uh, in terms of um, the employment uh, in Hawaii, it's a huge drop. It's a drop of about 100,000 people from 540 to, well, maybe 120,000 people unemployed uh, in the space of uh, very little. Could you go back one? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So this is just total employment in Hawaii. Uh, if we look at the next slide, this is leisure and hospitality. And so again, you can see that you know the their employment in the early '90s was you know about 90,000 people. It's you know had a pretty sl uh, steady growth upward, but by the early you know 2020, it had gone up to you know about 135, 137,000. Uh, but drops tremendously. So the, the reason to show you this is that, uh, you know, that precipitous drop that we saw for the, the state as a whole, a lot of it is coming from the leisure and hospitality, which is something most people knew. <laughs> if you live there, you know this. But uh, I think it's important to sort of know that, you know, this, this, in this recent downturn, 
a lot of the volatility or a lot of the job loss uh, has been impacted primarily in, in one industry and one industry, uh, you know, uh, the heaviest, I guess. If you go to one more, the next slide, please. So this is a different industry altogether. This is manufacturing. Uh, and you see manufacturing is smaller overall. It's, you know, in the 20,000 uh, employed in the early 90s. And that share has fallen, you know, precipitously again over time. Uh, it fell as well in, in, the, in the pandemic, but it didn't have that much, far, that, much um, that low to go. There was a small share to begin with. Uh, so again, just as, as a comparison industry, uh, manufacturing, you know, while taking huge losses, uh, it, it doesn't account for the, the huge share that we saw in the very first figure. And so I think I just wanted to sort of emphasize that, that some industries are especially vulnerable. Uh, again, if you live in Hawaii, you kind of know this because you have family who work in these industries and you know what's going on with them. But I think it's important to be able to see that figure uh, sort of graphically uh, that, the, you know, the accounting for the, the biggest drop really comes from uh, one or two industries in Hawaii. And so I'll stop there. Mahalo. Mahalo for that. Um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about uh, some of the industries that are vulnerable. So I want to actually um, talk a little bit about vulnerability. So we're in 2020, and many of the statistics that we're seeing around climate change in 2030, that 2030 is like doomsday, right? Um, in terms of sea level rise, in terms of, of heating, uh, global heating, and, and, and other effects, um, I'm wondering, in, in 10 years from now, 2030, what's your sense of the interplay between climate change and the global economy? So, uh, you know, forecasting is really difficult because uh, there are so many things that change. The sort of uh, politics, it depends on who leaders are in different countries, as we've just seen over the past four years. Uh, the, the direction in which uh, agreements can go and agreements can be made on various things, various agreements to curb um, pollution, but also sort of uh, carbon dioxide um, uh, in the atmosphere uh, and other greenhouse gases. Those things can all hinge on, again, so 10 years down the line is a long time to predict. Nevertheless, uh, given sort of the uh, scientific evidence that climate change is real and climate change is uh, impending, uh, it certainly will have a big impact on certain countries around the planet. I think that's what you were sort of asking uh, on about. Uh, and there will be winners and there will be losers. Some communities, some countries will have a longer growing period. They'll have more temperate temperatures uh, and others will see, you know, potentially increased um, adverse weather conditions, which will make it more difficult to have sustained economic development. So, the, the extent to which you can perfectly predict that is the extent to which you can perfectly predict weather uh, and, and out, uh, extreme uh, sort of deviations in temperature. And there's a bunch of economists that have been doing work on this in particular with regard to worker productivity and worker health. Uh, when temperatures really drop outside or you know, so go beyond the standard bound and they find that, you know, workers in, 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 um, factories, but also especially uh, agricultural workers are, are you know, particularly harmed, are, are unable to work as long, are uh, less productive, um, let alone the sort of productivity of the land and the resources uh, as well. So, so I mean, I think the, 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 sum, the summary of it is uh, it's going to add a lot of noise in a lot of directions. Uh, and then you compile that with the potential change and the impact of political change and uh, shifting um, alliances, uh, those things make it quite, um, you know, hard to predict. Thank you for that. I, I wonder if I might lob this over to Keone. You know, he follows a lot of environmental trends and climate change trends as well. Just, I, I mean, the basic question is, should we follow global trends? And, and, and if so, why should we care from a local economy perspective? Um, you know, wherever you stand on climate change, you know, whether you're a denier or a believer, uh, you know, I'm just going to kind of be agnostic of that and just speak from a, from an economic perspective. 
um, from an economic perspective. So an economy, the economy in our, the way our societies are currently configured is the engine that drives our society. Um, some may argue that this engine is driving us to um, self-destruction and the extinction of our species, right? And um, others don't believe that. Um, but the engine is the engine, right? And the engine is going to keep running regardless of what we believe. And um, so when you think about that, like, it's going to keep going, right? And so you're either going to participate in some at proactive way, or you're just going to continue to do what's been done and just watch what happens. Um, what I think is something that's important from an economic perspective is to think about risk. So risk drives investment, right? It's about risk and return, right? And so with climate change, well, I like to actually say climate disruption because I am a believer that it's man, it's accelerated by humans. So with climate disruption, what it's doing is creating uncertainty and uncertainty is really bad from a risk management perspective. And so when you think about economics from, from risk management, um, there are actually commercial incentives. There's financial incentives for the business, for, for businesses uh, and, 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 and such to actually start to be the change, right? So, you know, private sector is gonna have to participate in it because they, they don't wanna have uncertainty. They want to have control at, at understand their risk. Um, I saw this at the IUCN opening. So when we hosted IUCN, the uh, International um, the Conservation Congress, yes. the president of IUCN, he stood up there in his keynote opening and he was like, you know, there is a business case for, for conservation now, right? And it's because of risk. And so you can either participate and be early in to this new economy, this new way of looking at uh, climate change and factoring it into a core part of your business and your business model, right? And you're gonna be early in for growth opportunities. Like if you believe that climate change is real and it's gonna happen, like you get ahead of it and you, you will have more to gain. If you don't participate, right? Then you, you're, gonna, you're gonna be behind the game, right? There's gonna be more disruption and there's gonna be more missed opportunities for you for business and investment. So there is an imperative, a private sector business economic imperative to incorporate sustainability, climate change and such into your business models. Absolutely, and I, I see a comment from uh, Chip Fletcher. You know, he is a celebrated scientist and he's in agreement. There's, his comment says, there is no legitimate debate on climate change. The threats are huge for Hawaii. It's a climate emergency, so he's just, affirming exactly what you said. So, um, Kiani, here's another one. Is it, you know, we've had, we've, I've heard so many different slogans. Um, is it renew or reboot Hawaii's economy? And what's the fundamental difference? Uh, I don't think it's either. Okay. I think, I think it's transform our economy. Because okay. renew is like a, maybe a refresh. And reboot would be just going, restarting it and doing exactly what we did, uh, that we have. So if you use the word reboot, like think about it from an, oper that's an operating system word, like a computer, right? So the operating system of our old pre-COVID economy uh, was all, it left us very vulnerable. We were over um, invested into one, uh, one uh, industry as, as Dr. Key pointed out, right? And so, uh, we need to change that because the outcomes that were being created from that system were not serving us. Let's just be really honest. Our economy was already a dumpster fire before COVID. All COVID did was pour gas on it, right? We have, you know, half of our people living paycheck to paycheck. We've come uh, accepting, we've accepted the reality and normalcy of our friends and family moving away for better opportunity. We live in crowded homes, you know, like, are, it just wasn't working to begin with. So why would we try to go back to that when we know that those outcomes were bad? So for me, it's about how do we transform our economy? And in order to transform something, like we need a form follows function. So what's the function of our future economy? And if, if we have our way, right? Like I wanna see equity, economic justice. I wanna see social justice. I wanna see environmental sustainability and regenerative, right? So if those things are important to us, 
we have to set those goals and design our economy and our systems to achieve those goals. Absolutely. So what are the, what then are the, 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 the barriers to be removed? Are they structural? Are they altitudinal? Are they political? In order to transform our economy and to realize the economy that you're speaking about, one that is more just, that is more equitable, what are the barriers to be removed? Consciousness. I think it's consciousness. I think it's uh, us as the people just accepting the reality and understanding the reality and of, of our economy and the outcomes that our old economy, our dying economy, uh, pre-COVID economy wasn't working for us, right? And so let's just call it out. Let's just be honest. And then, you know, there's an Albert Einstein quote, right? Uh, no, no problem can be solved from the same consciousness that created it, right? Uh, and so we have to change our consciousness first. I don't know what all the answers is. Like, this is a really deeply rooted, complex, systemic problem. For if anybody today tells you, this is the solution, here's the policy or the thing we need to do, and it's gonna, it's gonna, this is the answer. You just laugh at them in their face because like, there is no way you can predict today what the answer is. The only way we're gonna figure it out is by trying. We have to set our intentions, we have to set a vision, and we have to collectively work together to get there. And we're gonna succeed, we're gonna fail, we're gonna learn along the way, but it's a process. It's not, there's no silver bullet. Thank you, I love that. I love all of those uh, sentiments. Shannon, you know, as president of Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce and as a small business person, um, what's your vision? Or what are you hearing from your members from the Empire Chamber of Commerce? What is, what is the emergent vision for Hawaii? So I think, uh, you know, I really like what Keone said, that it's not a reboot or a refresh, but a transformation. And um, to kind of build off of that, I think it's going to require an attitudinal shift um, amongst our leaders, um, amongst our community, you know, it's really going to be a Kako effort and we all kind of need to, to change our mindset. Um, I, I personally see a little bit of a danger in just kind of, okay, um, you know, understanding that we were over reliant on tourism. Okay, let's find something else. And I see a little bit of a danger in just kind of latching on to another industry um, without really giving it a lot of thought. And so, you know, my vision and my call to action for our leaders is to really um, engage in the community, engage the community. So, you know, Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce has been invited to meetings with our political leaders. And, you know, that's great. But, you know, are they really listening to us? Are they really taking what we're saying you know, to heart. I would hate to see all of these meetings just kind of be for show. So, I mean, my hope is that we will continue to have these conversations and that we will continue to be heard and taken seriously. Um, from the community level, you know, we need people to join our chambers, to um, get engaged, to tell us what your needs are, to tell us what your thoughts are so that we can pass that, you know, up. So um, I think there's got to be a change on, on multiple levels. And, you know, it's not a quote, but I saw an article that KITV posted that was from CNN. Um, and the title was, there is no getting back to normal. And the sooner we accept that, the better. And, you know, the gist is that those who are holding on to what they remember as normal, um, that, that that will return or is right around the corner, you know, though, those are going to be the ones that are at a, going to be at a disadvantage and um, accepting that there, you know, maybe cliche, but there is a new normal, but trying to figure out what that is, um, I think is, is going to be important. Yeah. Change uh, brings on a lot of fear, right? Uncertainty. And I, and I think that's going to be something that we're going to have to navigate together. Yeah, change management. We have a question from uh, from the audience, and this is you know for any of you who'd like to to respond. Can panelists comment on the dangers of predatory economic interventions like vulture funds and disaster capitalism more broadly? 
that leverage short-term but large crises and lack of political projections for short-term gain with no sustainable lo local economy even considered. Uh, that's a big one. Um, it's a big one. Well, and, and we could localize it. We could localize it, right? There's a, there's a lot of CARES funding that is that's being funneled to states and to, to our state and to the county, um, county all the counties. So is it really like, gonna, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the I'll go off. I think it's uh Neil, the disaster capitalism. I think is from Naomi Klein, um, and it has some. It's around like when there's crisis. Uh, you know, uh, capitalists come in and they they privatize public goods and services, right? Um, and and the outcome of which uh, creates more inequalities. Like Hurricane Katrina, I think is the 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 prime example for that. So if you look at it from here, from a Hawaii context with this crisis, um, you know, I think it's something valid to worry about. Um, but going back to my initial point around consciousness and um, collective values. Like if we are actively participating and we as the community are calling for certain things, holding folks accountable, you know, setting what we want our intentions and goals to be for our new economy, then, you know, and participating in the process, right? Like voting um, and holding our leaders accountable, at least from the political perspective. Um, hopefully we avoid situations like that. But again, like the reason why we're in this mess, let's not get it wrong. Like we, Hawaii's had the same business plan, economic business plan since the 1950s, right? We have a 70 year old business plan and it was about growth. It was about like selling out our land, right? And they, there was no incentive to change because you could just grow our way out of our problems. And, but we grew our way out of our problems by invest, putting all of our eggs in one basket. Now that basket fell apart. And so we're stuck like trying to figure it out. Um, we knew we were in a bad situation from the nineties, right? Like we knew we were overly invested in tourism. And so, you know, when you think about what we're going to do, we need to have a better business plan, right? And um, that business plan cannot be profit driven by profit maximization. Right, like profit maximization is what has it, that's the that's the recipe and that algorithm for for our global economy, right? And you know you see it play out here in Hawaii, right? Like highest they, they always say highest and best use for for real estate, right? And so what do we get? We get developments, we get land speculation, right? And so we have to change that algorithm, and the algorithm has to change from profit maximization at any cost to life to sustainability, to equity, to justice, those things, right? So that we have different measures and we have different things to um, design our systems and uh, outcomes to design our systems around. Um, I know that's kind of getting off the point of that disaster capitalism question, but the more that we're engaged, uh, I think we prevent those, that types of scenario from happening. Thank you. Um, talking about engagement, let's shift to self-governance. So this question is for Dr. Aki. So, um, you know, we can continue as a, as a people to uh, be a part of this profit maximization model um, at the cost of environment, at the cost of social coherence. Um, and there's this, you know, inherent conflict of short-term gains versus long-term outcomes. So a very broad question. How should we think about self-governance right now in a post-COVID economy? <clears throat> you know, As um, it yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, one of the things that Haunani K. Trask has been advocated, advocating for and on since I remember her, her arguments or sort of the need for a land base, the need for Native Hawaiians to have resources uh, upon which to conduct the economic activities as defined and prioritized as valued by Native Hawaiians. Um, and so that's one of the issues and that's self-governance, having territory, having uh, you know, jurisdiction. So yeah, I, I think 
the discussion that we've been having uh, supposes the continuation of the existing political system uh, and not a hybrid and not a different one. Uh, and so I think that's true. We have to have a discussion on where we see the future, where we see uh, Native Hawaiians uh, as indigenous people, as a political group. Uh, we have to think short term, meaning the next 10, 15 years, but we also should be thinking long term, the next 50 years. Where do we see the Lahui? Do we see a self governing uh, entity? And planning for that, uh, you know, both short term and long term plans are important. And, you know, one of the things I think um, that I'll show, uh, can I show that one slide, uh, that last jewel? Uh, you know, sort of indigenous, one more, one more. Yeah, there. Just to give you an example, so Native community, Native tribal nations in the U.S., uh, continental U.S., have been pushing the frontier of, of environmental conservation, just like we have in Hawaii. Uh, they've been creating industries that are self-sustaining, but also reinforcing their culture and their uh, community. So these are just the, like four examples that I'll give you. Uh, one is this Red Lake in um, northern Minnesota uh, 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 tribe. They created walleye, which is a fish recovery program. This fish was almost extinct, but they implemented on their own and in collaboration with uh, local fishermen how to govern the fishing and the overfishing of those, of those fish. Essentially, they created their own, they reinstituted, let's say, their own social governance norms, not just for themselves, but also for the non-Indians, the non-Natives. And now the walleye are back and they're thriving again, right? After hundreds of years, well, they were there for thousands of years, they were almost wiped out, but they took it on themselves to create the conservation plan that ensured the continuance of this very important resource, this important sort of you know, ancestor and relative of theirs. Another example is the Zuni Eagle Sanctuary. It's this amazing model where eagle feathers are incredibly important to American Indian traditions, their ceremonies, uh, but you can't get eagle feathers because they're endangered species. You can't just go and pluck a feather off an, uh, of, a, of an eagle. Uh, but these, this tribe in New Mexico uh, created a place where they take care of injured eagles that have been you know, hit by trucks or got, you know, fly into buildings. And they live and they take care of these uh, eagles. And every year when they molt, they give off feathers. And these feathers are used in their own tradition, in their own ceremony, but also to their communi other communities. They're able to give these resources out to neighbors. Uh, the other is the Lummi Land Bank, which is just, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like the Nature Conservancy, but uh, sort of a native version of that. They create this, this land trust where their land is protected uh, and other communities, non-native, pay them to keep, this is along uh, Puget Sound, uh, and other communities pay them to keep their land in a pristine fashion where they're replanting native plants and trees and um, uh, you know, sort of equals, uh, waterfront ecosystem uh, uh, plants and, and anti-erosion type, um, uh, yeah ecosystems, I should say. Uh, and, and so they're just really sort of reimagining their sort of agency in these, on these sort of environmental frontiers. And then there's Isleta del Sur, which is right outside of El Paso, Texas. They are uh, an American Indian reservation. They actually had a casino until the year 2002. So that was their economic development. Sounds just like Hawaiians, right? Uh, tourism or Hawaii. Uh, the state of Texas, uh, won a lawsuit and so they weren't allowed to operate their casino anymore after 2002. So their economic development went off a cliff. Instead, what did they do? They re-envisioned what it is their economy was going to be and they created a pretty holistic plan to be, uh, you know, sort of community-based, uh, community-oriented and not just a single industry. So anyway, my point in, in, in talking about this is that there are ways in which Native peoples are already innovative, uh, and they're already innovative in things that they care about, uh, things that are part of their culture, things that are part of their history, uh, and they're actually quite successful in it. So we have, we have, you know, 300 models across the United States 
where people are doing this already. And um, I think there's lots of opportunities to learn and to figure out which parts work in Hawaii and which parts don't. Mahalo for that. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna throw this question over to Shannon. This is kind of a loaded question. You know, Hawaii, we rely on, on military dollars and you, um, part of your business is dealing with Department of Defense and, and military contracts. Um, how do we deal with the inherent tension of our claims for self-governance? And do we continue to do business with military or do we not do business with military? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is a loaded question, but um, I think a necessary one because, you know, as I alluded to in when I first spoke, I, I, I do see a danger of us trying to replace tourism with federal contracting and in particular defense contracting. Um, just based on, you know, kind of the efforts that our local government is, is and the resources that they're putting into, um, you know, the new website on, on defense spending. Um, it is the second largest industry, you know, that we have. Um, and so, and it has been relatively unaffected by COVID-19 because the federal government has continued on with their contracts. You know, as far as I'm aware, you know, very few of my clients have actually had contract cancellations. So yes, it is a stable, um, it, for this particular situation, it has been stable. Now, when there's political tensions, such as, um, you know, can we pass a budget? Can we pass a National Defense Authorization Act? The government contractors are going to be the first ones to be harmed in that situation because, you know, um, if there's a shutdown, then yes, they're not getting paid. Um, so in this situation, you know, they have um, been relatively unaffected. So I can understand why it might be, you know, something that is, is being pushed. Um, I just, I see a danger because I think there are larger issues, community issues, cultural issues, um, you know, um, kind of following up on Dr. Aki, you know, I, I do think we have a lot to learn from other indigenous peoples. So the tribes, the Alaskan, Alaska natives, you know, they have, been able to come to certain agreements um, and work things out because they do have that status, that political um, status. And so they, you know, Native Hawaiians are at a little bit of a disadvantage in, in that respect. Um, so, you know, there is, there is a tension, but I think, um, you know, there are a lot of high profile projects and lease renewals that are coming up. And I know that the government has been very proactive in wanting to engage community in those conversations. And so I really applaud them. But again, kind of going back to what I said, I just, I hope that they're not just, um, those are not just for show. And I do hope that they, they will seriously take into consideration, you know, the community's needs and the community's thoughts. Um, so in the short term, you know, I, I think we kind of need to work with, within the system that that we have right now but you know obviously longer term um that's going to be a little bit of a different question which you know right now i don't know the answer to but um you know again those are conversations that we're all going to need to have collectively yeah those are, those are complex um scenarios to to look at right um, we're getting quite a few questions uh, from our audience members. So this question I want to throw to Kioni, and this is about an economic future that's inclusive and prioritizes Aina. Can you share a little bit about Aina Aloha Economic Futures and any other ideas that you have um, around the transformation of economy that prioritizes Aina and relationships? Yeah, you know, the question was really about like, community engagement and process. And, you know, I think from a Lahui perspective, you know, if we look at uh, recent developments, you know, the Mauna, Punana Niho, Kahuku, um, you know, an example is kind of just front and center. Um, it's on the back end. Our engagement is real heavy on the back end, 
you know, on, on the later stages of the process. And not just, I'm not criticizing it or, or anything like that, but I think we have to get to the point where we are playing offense, not defense. Um, and where we, where those types of projects don't even get that far, um, that there is true community engagement. You know, like I said, this is economic transformation, right? Uh, there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers. And I don't mean it in a very zero sum game like that, but I mean like we have to, everybody's going to have to make sacrifices for long term, short term sacrifices for long term game. Um, and, you know, what people value and consider sacrifice and value what they value is going to be different and the only way you're gonna you're gonna work through that is through a true community engagement process um you know a little bit earlier i talked about like how our our, our people are struggling right um it's tough to live here people moving away i think we really have to call it what it is and for the most part people in hawaii and and especially our lahui uh it's it's oppression Right, it's oppression. So, you know, taking some lessons from uh, folks around liberation, you know, like Paulo Freire, right? It's about shared struggle, uh, unity, and organization. And so, I think the shared struggle is there, um, you know. And then there are examples of when you organize and you're unified and you're organized, you're successful. I mean, Mauna Kea being case in point, right? Um, and so, you know, we have now a Lahui that's uh, relatively engaged. Um, as compared in the last 10 or 15 years, I think it's kind of a, a new awakening. And so how do we leverage that power? How do we leverage that unity and organization um, to be playing offense rather than defense? And so, um, you know, in that spirit, in these conditions and these ecosystem of like Lahui engagement, um, some of us were having pauhanas uh, in this uh, shelter in place um, started and it was mostly just grumble sessions and kind of sharing information about what you, we were each seeing from our different vantage points. And what ended up happening was the Aina Aloha um, declaration came out of that. And um, the strategy really behind Aina Aloha is built on those fundamental principles of struggle, unity, and organization. So we know that we're all struggling. That's pretty easy to understand. So we wanted to create something around unity and organization. So the value set of the Aina Aloha movement, the four core values, right? Um, that was really about unifying. Um, that here are some universal values that we all can ascribe to. Hawaiian, not Hawaiian, you know, wherever you are on different spectrums. I think the thing that really sets us apart as Hawaii are our collective values. As people who live on islands, whether you are OEV or have come however many generations or years ago, uh, when you live on an island, you take on that mentality of, yeah, we're all in it together. Relationships are very different in our community versus if you were to live someplace else. Um, and so that sense of collective values, the shared responsibilities that we're in it together, that um, my actions affect you and your, effect, uh, your actions affect me. That's all part of the code, right, of our culture. And so we wanted to uplift that and to unify people. And then the, the process of engaging community to solicit feedback, help us evolve the, um, the, the action agenda and the proposals and all of that was really just about us saying, hey, we wanna engage and co-create with community. We don't wanna be prescriptive. We wanna make sure that we are grounded and centered in community. Uh, tell us what's good, tell us what's bad, challenge us. It was open. Um, you know, there was a lot of success, you know, from getting county councils to adopt it as resolutions, the Hawaii Tourism Authority, Kumeba Schools, you know, other big institutions. Um, but the best part about it was that community was holding us accountable um, and that, that we were having those conversations with folks throughout our community saying, why are you guys doing this? What about this? What about that? And just like checking us and us actually listening, responding and, and, and and adapting to that, right? Um, because this was never about the 14 of us who co-authored the declaration to drive the ship. It was just us helping to create a platform and a mechanism for the community, for us to drive as a community. So when you talk, look, when uh, the question was about how do we uh, 
inclusive economic future that prioritizes Aina. That's what this movement is about. Um, that's the core theory of change for Aina Aloha. It's about rebalancing the relationships between Kanaka and Aina. And it's also about leadership. Leadership is a big key here uh, because leadership is going to be the ones to help uh, work with community to set the vision, but also to be held accountable to community towards that vision. So leadership is super critical here. Mahalo. Hey, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Aki, what kind of, what new models or examples of hope and resilience are you seeing from Native, you know, Native communities that you interact with um, that we might be able to borrow and learn from in a post-COVID economy? Sure. So um, again, sort of some of those examples that, you know, sort of talked about uh, previously um, where the, the industry, the, the work, the, it's, again, it reinforces the existing community values, the existing, um, you know, uh, preferences, uh, culture, all of that. So again, like the, the Eagle uh, Sanctuary, the, the land bank that put into preservation use uh, these, these giant parcels of land along Puget Sound, along the, in their community. Those to me are the kinds of ways in which indigenous peoples are sort of at the forefront of, of reimagining, again, thinking about uh, the way in which they adapt to uh, evolving community needs, but also to evolving um, uh, environmental concerns as well. The, the other example that I've spoken about before, you know, an entire village in Alaska moved inland for, by 10 miles because they know that the water is coming. They know the land, they know the ocean, they've lived there and their ancestors have lived in that same spot for thousands of years, the same village. They know today that in a few years, they're gonna be underwater. So they took, again, a proactive uh, view and they moved their village inland by something like 10 miles. Um, so these communities, uh, in many cases, are at the forefront. They're sort of, you know, at the cutting edge of environmental uh, degradation, uh, collapse, uh, and instead of sort of, you know, sort of taking it for what it is, they're trying to sort of uh, reinvigorate or, or again, reimagine, as we've been saying, uh, what can be done to shore it up, to improve it, uh, and to create opportunities for themselves and their, their community members, right? Sort of finding ways to make this um, a, a renewable uh, and sustainable employment opportunities, right? Lots of this, for instance, lots of these sort of wildlife restoration and um, wetlands restoration projects are self-sustaining because others can come in now and fish the walleye that didn't used to be there. So they can issue their own permits and they can charge outsiders so and similar things happen in in other managed forests for instance so these are ways of you know reinforcing their values and their culture and the uh, their aina their their lands their waters uh but it also sustains their economic system as well it sounds like a fabulously sophisticated and elegant you know and relational microeconomy that 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 these indigenous peoples have created um, I'm wondering, with your expertise, uh, when we think about self-governance models and we think of our lahui and we think about um, creating an economy that is grounded in our values and our aloha for our aina, what kind of metrics, you know, do you think about? So if we were to think about new metrics outside of GDP, outside of GNP, how might we measure wealth for a new for our nation? So. Absolutely. So the, the, the current measure is right per capita income. Um, it's um, yeah, it's do you own a house and what's the value of the house. Uh, there are many other ways to measure well being. Uh, there's uh, caloric intake, right? Are you undernourished or not? Uh, are you uh, do you have interactions with uh, you know, a wide circle of family and friends? There are many dimensions. Actually, the Maori have been uh, developing these as well for their own well-being. So they've got a series of measures that um, 
some communities there, not all of them, uh, have been developing some of these non-standard, non-Western measures of well-being. So yeah, I think you think about it in terms of well-being. Uh, what's your health? What are, what's the diabetes level? What's the obesity level? What's the, um, yeah, how overcrowded is your home, right? Uh, so there are lots of measures that could measure well-being, and in a place like Hawaii, it would be, uh, you know, probably quite useful because Hawaii has a relatively high, compared to some other parts of the United States, uh, per capita income. Uh, that doesn't mean that living life is easy there, as everyone knows, because the cost of living is high and because people are sort of living in crowded conditions and various other things. So yeah, I think there are, are other metrics that exist and people have been experimenting with them. Um, one other thing real quick is, you know, we don't, uh, in this um, per capita income or GDP, we don't consider the uh, things that are shared amongst communities. So when somebody goes fishing and they, uh, you know, they stop up at one family's house and they leave half the fish and then they travel or a quarter of the fish and they leave another quarter of the fish and then they go home with the last quarter, right? That, that doesn't show up on paper anywhere. So that doesn't show up right. on your taxes, that doesn't show up on your 1099s or W-2s. But that's sharing of wealth, that's sharing of income there. And we don't, we don't see that. And that is not, that's something that's freely given, but that is a way of, of improving our overall well-being. Very true. We don't measure um, our generosity. Yeah. Thank you for that. So we're going to, we're going to like change the, the tempo a little bit. I'm going to do, we're going to do some lightning round kind of, kinds of questions. Okay. So we're just going to start off. When I say lightning round, I'll give the question and then we'll just go Shannon, Kioni, Dr. Aki. Okay, so the first question is around leadership. So what should education, um, what should education systems be doing to prepare the next generation of leaders? So it's been a while since I've been in school and my Kiki are only two years old. So, um, you know, I'm not necessarily as familiar with the education system right now, but what I can say is that, you know, um, I, and more from like a business perspective, you know, I think, um, you know, if there are more opportunities centered around kind of like running a business, things like that, that was one of the courses that I recall, um, you know, made a biggest, the biggest impact on me when I was in school. But then also really reinforcing the need um, to find a good mentor um, and really building, you know, mentorship programs. Because um, I can tell you, you know, for myself, I've, I've been very fortunate to have um, really good mentors. And I think that that's really key um, to building the next generation of leaders. Awesome. Mentorship and, and businesses or entrepreneurship. Awesome. Kioni, rapid fire style. <sighs> um, rethinking what education is, like the function, like it's to prepare our, our, our OPO and our youth for the future that they're going to inherit. So really looking at um, where Hawaii is headed and what kinds of skills and trades are necessary. So yeah, I think entrepreneurship is one, uh, preparing our, our, we have a unique and well-positioned opportunity as Kanaka to um, lead in the new green economy agriculture, conservation. So I think we should invest heavily into those things. Mahalo. After I keep. I think I um, agree with everything uh, Shannon Keone has said. I think um, uh, also sort of the idea of, I think in terms of building leaders, civics classes, right? This idea of sort of what government means, um, even sort of non-Western standards of government and, and systems of government. And I think, uh, you know, some of that gets shortchanged. Obviously, you know, Hawaiian history would be helpful as well. Uh, some of us got that in, got that, got those uh, courses, some of us didn't. And so I think, uh, you know, our public school teachers, uh, as well as our private school teachers, uh, you know, they have a lot to handle right now, of course, with COVID. This is an uh, unbelievable time everywhere. Um, but I think once uh, COVID is, you know, res Recite, we recedes to some extent. I think uh, you know, investing more heavily in education uh, in these types of courses makes for better citizens. Uh, whether you're tribal, native, Oevi, or American citizens, right? Just understanding how the government works is kind of important. Mahalo. Next lightning round question: uh, What are the three main things that the average Kanaka can do to help advance our lahui? What are the three main things 
that the average Kanaka can do to help advance our Lahui. This came from Kuikahi. So my three would be, you know, um, join an organization. I'm going to plug the chamber, such as the chamber, um, and, and make your voice heard that way. Um, I would also encourage you to support, you know, local and especially Native Hawaiian-owned small businesses. Um, and then, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, stay stay updated and stay educated on, on what's going on. I mean, I know that's hard right now because there's so much um, fake news and, you know, it's it's easy to get distracted by what, what the real facts are. But I think um, staying updated and being educated on issues um, and then tying that, tying that into um, Dr. Key's point about voting, um, that's really going to be important. So. Mahalo. Kiani. Three main things Sorry. that the Kanaka can do to advance our Lahui. Invest. <laughs> uh, invest your time to vote. Invest your time um, to uh, your time and your energy into things that matter to you. Um, and then the last is spend your dollars with your conscience. Um, be make you, you vote with your dollars and you invest with your dollars, right? So if you want to invest into a future like be really conscious about what you're spending your money on. You may not have a lot or you may have a lot. It doesn't matter. If you're intentional about how you spend your dollars, that's an that's a important way to do it. And so invest your time, invest your votes, uh, and invest how you spend. Mahalo. And to you. Dr. Oh, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, you should vote uh, in elections up and down, uh, local to national. I think also uh, you should in I think you were saying invest, also invest in your family, right? Making sure that you're taking care of your children. Most people are, uh, but uh, really sort of uh, that's, that's the place in which sort of, you know, investing in their political awareness, their knowledge, uh, their, their, um, their own well-being. So I think that's, uh, in, and again, that's like preaching to the choir because I know people know that. Um, and then, yeah, I think this idea of volunteering, volunteerism is important. Find the community groups, uh, organizations, nonprofits that are doing the work you believe in and support them. Great. You guys uh, mentioned the vote a lot. So here's a question for all of you as well. How might national elections or the U.S. elections, the U.S. elections affect Hawaii's attempts to transform our economy? What's your thoughts on that? Say that again, how might the national election and what happens? Um, the US presidential election affect or influence Hawaii's attempt to transform its economy. I don't know, but if things keep going in this direction, we're already going to have a Supreme Court that's going to make it really hard for, for Kanaka, right, um, in the future. And, you know, the, the more polarized we get, uh, you know, as we work closer and closer to, to the next civil war and secession from the union, uh, there might be a, a real opportunity for, for Hawaiian independence um, under kind of a different context. But... I don't know. It's it's crazy town. Like <laughs> that debate was bananas, embarrassing for the United States. So let's go to um, uh, a really popular question. That's a, that's in everyone's conversations. How do we how do we reduce our over reliance on tourism? What are your ideas to do that? So my thought has been for a while that it should be, uh, di obviously everyone says diversification, uh, but diversification doesn't, uh, is quite difficult when you're relying on export, exporting of goods and services, well goods, uh, because Hawaii is thousands of miles away from other markets. 
so my thought has been that uh, Hawaii can't be um, a major source of production uh, like we were for, with sugar and pineapple, for instance. We, could, we only sustain that because labor was incredibly cheap and there, wasn't, um, there were barriers that made um, it possible for Hawaii sugar and, and these products to, to compete on the world market, but they can't anymore. That's just wiped out. So I've always, so I've increasingly thought that it's the exporting of ideas and the, the creation of ideas uh, that Hawaii should become uh, a center for. Uh, it should be the new industry and, and it should take advantage of the kinds of topics that are important to Native Hawaiians and we have expertise in. Uh, and again, is related to the, the impending climate change and the mitigation effects that are necessary. Hawaii is a natural laboratory for this. Why not become the world leader in climate mitigation efforts, again, for an entire ecosystem from the, the shoreline, or actually below shoreline, from the coral reefs to the mountaintops? Why not be the, the, the thought leader in this? Uh, because it, again, it reinforces existing things that everyone, not everyone, but various communities are already doing and doing well. Uh, it aligns with Native Hawaiian values and, and um, concepts and, and culture. Um, and there's no one else doing it uh, in a broad sense right now. There are bits and pieces around the planet, but there's no one place that is, you know, the laboratory. There is no one Silicon Valley of climate mitigation technologies and innovation. Why couldn't it be a place like Hawaii? We've already, so, and just to be clear, we're already leaders in another sort of revitalization area, and that's the Hawaiian language. That's the native language reclamation. Re reclamation. We have done it such that we are the, the, the model that other indigenous peoples look to when they want to revitalize their language, especially in the continental US, right? So as indigenous peoples, as native peoples, we've already uh, established ourselves as leaders there. And then you can think about, um, you know, um, voyaging. That's another area where we have established ourselves through the help of our other Polynesian, our Micronesian cousins, don't, don't get me wrong, uh, but as being able to sort of be leaders in, in areas that we wouldn't have thought of, you know, a generation, a generation and a half ago. So I really think that's, that's the kind of stuff we should be looking at for Native Hawaiians. Agreed. And we also have, you know, um, renowned thought leadership in the areas of natural resource management, conservation biology. Absolutely. And yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our, our okay. bench is thick. Our bench is, our bench is uh, you know, deep in that now. That's right. Anybody else want to take that question as well? Yeah, so I think, you know, that there are other industries that we can explore um, and really try to advance here. But I think the core problem that, you know, we're going to have with any industry are some of the underlying issues. Um, high cost of living, you know, um, lack of or limited resources here high labor costs, um, you know, shipping costs, um, things like that. So I don't know, I mean, I, I do think that there are opportunities for other industries. Like I think, you know, cyber and IT is one, we need to have, you know, kind of a qualified um, and educated workforce. Um, and then we also need to kind of address some of the underlying challenges, which um, is immensely difficult. I mean, the cost of living is something that we've been, you know, trying to address for forever. So um, I think there are opportunities. You know, I was actually on a webinar the other day and I, I heard Pono Shim talking about um, exporting Hawaii. And I don't think, you know, manufacturing on a large scale is necessarily feasible, but certainly, you know, for folks that can't come here right now or it's not, you know, practical, I mean, for us to be able to provide um, products and things, you know, like that, I, I do think that's doable. Um, but we're going to need to help our Native Mind businesses scale up. And, you know, there are accelerator programs, but they can only take so many, you know, so many companies. And so I think um, just in general, we need to provide more resources to, to our, our local businesses um, 
in a number of different areas. But I, I do think that um, exports, you know, could be a possibility, maybe not necessarily on a large, large scale. Mahalo. Kioni? Um, you know, when you look at what's the response to a, a, a global interconnected vulnerable, you know, extractive uh, suicide economy, like the only response to that is local resiliency. And so you're hearing that word resiliency a lot, um, but let's really look at and unpack what that is, right? Um, it's about being, a, it's, it's really about local investment and building up our local economy. Um, to, to embody the values and outcomes that we want, right? So local investment, um, you know, for example, like tourism. When we used to own tourism, it worked a lot better for us. We don't own tourism anymore. So all the profits, money may be coming into Hawaii, but a whole lot of money is going right back out. And so it's that idea of, if you look at what's coming in and what's going out, we need to be able to retain more value and profits here in Hawaii because we know that a, a strong local economy has a multiplier effect. When dollars do come in, they circulate three, four times. There's a multiplier factor, right? Um, whereas if it just comes in and tourism and the profits go right back out, all it pays for is maybe some real estate taxes, some TAT, and then uh, some low, low paying jobs, which then the government has to subsidize uh, people's uh, ability to live. That doesn't work, right? So, you know, we have to tighten the ship and, and and not let anything leak out of our local economy, right? We spend $6 billion um, to buy energy, right? Uh, and so we, we need to get out of this mindset of uh, waiting for a savior or some industry to come in, um, like trying to build the next Silicon Valley and have all these tech folks come here and work. That's not like people have been trying to bank on that for 20 years and it doesn't happen, right? And I, I really disagree with it because it's, we have intelligence here. We have unique IP that we can scale up. So I agree with what Dr. Aki talks about, like, and, and what you mentioned Mahina around, uh, around our conservation, like Ike Hawaii, if it can be repurposed and reapplied to solve contemporary problems and create contemporary solutions, like to me, that like is our IP, right? Diversity, equity, uh, sustainability, inclusion, those things are, are more of the norm here in Hawaii than anywhere else in the world. So, and that's where people are aspiring to. That's where uh, more progressive leaders and investors and philanthropists, that's what they're investing in. So if we highlight our culture and we highlight DEI and we highlight our sustainability, IK and IP, and we invest in ourselves rather than waiting for somebody else to come in and we tighten it up where we have local ownership, right? And we're circulating our money. To me, that's, that's the recipe we have to look at. Awesome. Yes. Agreed with everything that you said. So we're going to start to, um, start to wrap it up in a little bit. Um, there's one question though, that an audience member really wants one of you to, to address if possible. This is from Kelly Isuza. What are your thoughts on the US government reparations on slavery? And do Kanaka have a valid claim to do something, to, to do something similar for the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom? Just and if we feel like that's not our area of expertise, not a problem, but I'd like to um, honor just, this person. Sure, oh, just sure. give Hawaiians land back. I mean, of course, why not? I mean, that's the, the most straightforward answer, right? Uh, all, you know, that's what ceded lands are. And that's what, you know, Kalahui Hawaii has been, you know, arguing and fighting for for decades now. Yeah, that's the, it, it, reparations is a completely different story. Yeah, that's a completely different Juliana and it's hard, and we aren't part of that. Um, that's their story. That's their, their, their fight. And we should support them in that, uh, just as we should support, you know, sort of American Indians and in their push for sovereignty and their land back uh, in various places. Um, and our story is a different one too. It's a different political, historical situation. But yeah, sure. I mean, who wouldn't, that, that should be our push. It was unjust, we know it. Yep. Land, <laughs> and, <laughs> land and energy are the two biggest levers to our economic success, right? Those are the things we need to figure out. And so. I'm total agreement with that. And I think, you know, these ideas of right, what the cutting edge technology is for, you know, 
solar, what, what can be done? Like, yeah, it's Hawaii is, we're so on the verge of, you know, being able to think about it in ways that others can't. And I think, um, and I think you're right. I think that's one of the limiting factors of economic development. Again, all these other places, Hong Kong, all these other islands, Japan, they all are by continents. Hawaii isn't by a continent. So we have to ship everything in as Keone is saying, I mean, goods and services, but most importantly, energy resources. And so figuring out a way to do it renewably would be a game changer, of course, as well. I like where this is going, so I'm gonna throw another one at you then. So what, that, what economic drivers or levers uh, that value native Hawaiian rates and community-based models of management and leadership are needed then? What, you know, what are the incentives? What are the levers? What are the drivers or the tools that are needed to put this into place? Ooh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I know that governance and self-determination um, are core to that. Um, what that looks like, that's way above my pay grade and my intelligence, I think. Um, there are other folks who this is probably their, their level of expertise. Um, from, but from an economic perspective, you know, the economy should be designed to support the values and outcomes that society wants, right? So oftentimes it really should be looked at as a political economy, right? Like there is a system of governance along with the system of exchange that work hand in hand, right? The political um, leaders and winners in the political system support the business winners, the eco economic winners, and it's kind of a self-fulfilling thing. So you cannot look at one without the other. And so um, we, when we think about like what Hawaii needs to have from a political economy perspective, we can definitely look back um, for things that worked um, Makavakahiko, even through the kingdom, uh, but we have a very different context now. So it's about, again, going back to design, right? Form follows function. So what is the function? What is the outcomes that we want to see? And then the form um, that it needs to take. And from an economic perspective, we can design systems of exchange and, uh, policies and, and whatnot based, but I think first and foremost, we have to really come to agreement on what our goals and outcomes are and then the governance that's necessary to make that happen because, you know, the, is a centralized government make sense for us or do we go back to more Moku based, um, based um, systems of self-governance? You know, there's a reason why our, our, our Kupuna had it set up that way. And so we should, we should really look at those things um, but again, that's that's not my area of expertise. Anybody else want to comment? Good. Okay, Shannon, I have a question for you, and then we're gonna to start to wrap this all up. You know, as a wahine um, business leader and and community leader, and do you have your own children? I do. You do. So as a mom as well, um, what advice do you have for young women? who are aspiring to become um, uh, their own, you know, be, be an entrepreneur or become the uh, nonprofit um, uh, executive or a community leader? So I know, you know, um, as part of the preparation for this, you know, one of, one of the questions was, um, is entrepreneurship for everyone? And, you know, to be honest, this is not where I saw myself um, being, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I went to law school. I thought I was going to be an attorney, you know, practice at a law firm, and that was going to be my life. And I wanted the security of being able to um, have an employer and, you know, have that security. I thought that owning a business was too risky, and, you know, I was just kind of risk risk averse um, but life happens things happen and here I am today with my business partner and um, you know I would say don't rule anything out because you just you might not you know know what what can happen and for for us this has been a blessing we both have children we both have um, you know outside activities and this has really provided us with the flexibility um, that we need 
but it has taken us a long time to get here. So we're now going into our sixth year of business. Um, we have a great reputation. So my, my advice was don't rule anything out um, and persevere um, even when things, when things may seem, seem challenging. Awesome, you guys. So we're going to start to wrap up and I just want to offer up a closing comment for, for each person. Um, so, you know, I, I love this quote by Joseph Campbell. We must be willing to let go of the life we plan so as to have a life that is waiting for us. We must be willing to let go of the life we planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. So this can be a really tough time. This is a tough time for, for most of us. Well, it's a tough time for humanity, right? So much uncertainty, so much loss, so much grief, um, a lot of struggle. And at the same time, we're seeing amazing uh, public-private sector partnerships. We're seeing unlikely bedfellows, if you will, coming together from large institutions to small businesses, community leader, grassroots activists, um, with industry leaders coming together for a common purpose, and that's to care for one another, for one another as as kanata, and to care for our beloved Hawaii. So, if you wouldn't mind, just you share, what's your hope for Hawaii? And what's your call to action as we, we look forward to a future that is more generative, that is more abundant, that is more just, that is more equitable, and uh, makes right the wrongs of, of that have been afforded to Native Hawaiians. We'll start off with you, Native, uh, Dr. Aki. Thanks again for you know organizing this and inviting me. It's been fantastic. Uh, I'd just say <clears throat> the call to action is make sure everybody votes. Uh, make sure your Ohana votes, right? People who have never voted before, whether it's state election, federal elections, just vote. I think it's, it's the way we, in a democracy, ensure that our preferences, our goals are, are expressed in the government. As Keone was ex explaining earlier, it's super important because again, that makes those decisions are the things that affect our economic system, absolutely, right? Those laws, those tax uh, issues, all of that uh, impacts uh, zoning issues, all of these things matter. So please vote. Um, and my optimism for the future, I'm already optimistic. Uh, I think um, I'm a little bit older. Uh, I see so many amazing leaders here right now, but also on the Mauna and also in various parts of the Hawaiian community, whether again, it's immersion, uh, whether it's hula, whether it's voyaging, uh, people are out there doing it, whether it's the lo'i uh, or the local ia peoples out there, they're out there doing it and it's amazing. Hello, Shannon. I'm incredibly optimistic for our future. I mean, I have seen so much innovation and creativity from our local and Native Hawaiian owned small businesses just trying to adapt um, and really be creative in the things that they're doing. So, um, you know, if we can keep that going, I think our future is really, really bright. Um, and for, for our community and the Lahui as a whole. Um, you know, my call to action is just that, you know, given the nature of what we're going through right now, all hands need to be on deck and all available resources um, need to be used and, and deployed. So um, from the highest levels of government, you know, all the way down to, to our community level, um, everything needs to be deployed. Mahalo. Agreed. All hands on deck. All feet in the lobby. Kioni. Um, what gives me hope is, you know, this is an opportunity and a moment for Kanaka and OEV leadership to really step up and step in and start to influence within the structures of power. Um, we, we're not poor from an economic perspective. We have resources. Um, we are the fastest growing ethnic group in Hawaii, right? Uh, we're expected to double by 2050. Uh, we control, 
I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of acres, how many billions of dollars of, of assets. Um, when we come together as a Lahui, uh, there will be nothing that could stop us. And um, we have to, as a Lahui, figure out how to work together towards that end. Um, it's not easy. You know, there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of loss, there's a lot of oppression, and we all carry that in different ways, um, and we act accordingly in different ways, and we represent our communities in different ways. Um, I think we just, at the, we need to figure out how to set a higher vision that we can all ground ourselves to, um, be, and, and, you know, we're going to celebrate together when we win, and we're going to bear witness to each other when we, when, when, when we fall, but we pick each other up. We're going to disagree. Um, like to expect us all to agree 100% on something is a fallacy. It's, it's impossible. It's a, it's a nirvana fantasy. Um, but when we do disagree, how do we disagree with Aloha and remember the, the longer term vision um, and values that, that unite us, right? Um, that's the kind of stuff we have to do and we have to figure out how, how, you know, I think when you go back to that quote that you offered us up with, um, what it made me think about was outcomes. Um, I've kind of learned a little bit through uh, my age and, you know, getting a little bit older and having kids like, um, and recognizing my mortality, I think, um, when we have to detach ourselves from outcomes, when we detach ourselves from outcomes, um, it allows us to live, um, in the moment. It allows us to be free. It allows us to have an open mind. It allows us to, um, have aloha and compassion and empathy for others. Um, so, you know, when we get too heavily invested in one particular outcome, um, we, we, we put ourselves in a box and we limit the possibilities um, for ourselves and as a collective. Um, it, there is no straight line to success. There's no straight line for the island that we're navigating to. It's going gonna, it's gonna to meander and we may go backwards some days. We may sit still some days. We may go way over here some days, um, but we're all still trying to get there. Um, and that's kind of how I'm that mindset and I'm thinking like, we're just gonna go with what the conditions have for me right now, right in front of me, and we'll make the best decision. And I trust that you Mahina and you Dr. Aki and you Shannon and all the others have that same values as Kanaka and Aloha for each other and for this place. And um, you know, we may disagree today. Uh, we may be going in opposite directions today, but I know at some point we're gonna turn and we're moving in that same direction. Just gotta have faith um, in that and, and keep going. Thank you, Keone, for that. I just want to celebrate um, one of the things that we discussed when we were preparing for this conversation is that we just want to acknowledge our community, our Lahui, for all, all of what they're doing, all of the sacrifice that you uh, are taking on, whether it be a sacrifice of time or sacrifice of a little bit of resource so that we can all uh, share, you know, our, our, abundant, our abundance and, and what we have. I think um, this is our time. This is our moment. And we've been, we have been preparing for this um, and, and we have to exercise now um, the wherewithal and the courage to lean in and we can create a better economy for all in Hawaii. That's my belief and that's what I heard from all of you folks and we need to do this together. So, e kuulahui, mahalo ya oko pakahi, hei ya hui ana kako, e noke mau, e noke mau na kapona, noke aloha kaina, aloha nui. And thank you, Davis and to Shane. We want to oha for inviting us to participate. Mahalo, mahalo nui mahina, mahalo to all of you panelists. Wow, what a uh, what an amazing um, discussion. So much valuable ike mana all shared from 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 each of you. Um, the, the comments are going off. I don't think I've seen, uh, out of all these webinars that we've done, I don't think I've seen this much engagement in the, in the threads. So mahalo nui, very important conversation. And, 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 you know, the takeaway here, I think, I mean, there's a lot to unpack, a lot was shared, but common thread here is, is participate, vote. Um, I'll just add my two cents, you know, uh, the ideas that we've heard here were, were so, um, phenomenal. Yeah, talking about energy production, management of land, control of land and resources. I mean, just those two issues alone that you're dealing with, like Keone said, uh, a very, very um, steep climb 
to get to the top of that power structure that controls those resources and decides how those resources um, are, are utilized uh, and decide how we access those resources, whether it be energy or land. And the only way for us to exercise our own um, uh, control over those resources is to work together, collaborate, and that takes community engagement, that takes working with each other. It takes working with folks that you don't agree with constantly. The, we're gonna have to engage with those folks that control the resources. We have to, because that's the only way we're gonna take it back. And I am confident that we will take it back. Hawaiians will control land, we will control energy, all of it's coming and we get in there, yeah? And it's going the collective action is what is required. So, and especially in these trying times, malama each other, first step, take care of each other, aloha kikahi kikahi, and um, you know, the vote is coming right around the corner. That's one tool, as we've said in multiple uh, episodes here, voting is one tool in the toolbox. Go sharpen that tool and wield it wisely uh, come election time. You can go to oha.org slash vote to get all your information about the upcoming elections. We do know ballots are dropping next week uh, in Hawaii. So be prepared for that. Check your mail. Talk to your ohana. Don't fight at them with them. Don't scream at them, but engage. Talk story and, and share these videos. You can catch all these videos um, on oha.org slash vote. So uh, for those of you watching on Zoom, you're going to get a survey when, the, when we log out of here. So please take a couple minutes to answer that survey. And mahalo nui to all of you. Uh, we will hopefully catch you folks in a couple weeks. Um, this is going to be our last episode for, uh, for now. But we are putting together something uh, in, in advance of the election. So we'll get, look out, stay tuned for those updates. Mahalo nui, everyone. Uh, have a good weekend. Aloha.